Welcome to this afternoon session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we'll be focusing on a new book by Francine Hirsch entitled Soviet Judgment in Nuremberg, A New History of the International Military Tribunal After World War II, published by Oxford University Press in a session that is co-sponsored today by the Wilson Center's Cannon Institute. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University, co-chair of the Washington History Seminar, along with my colleague, Christian Osterman of the Wilson Center. The seminar is a collaborative venture of the Woodrow Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association's National History Center. And for the past decade, the seminar has been meeting weekly, usually if not always on Mondays. We've had a rather full lineup of authors and books that we've featured in this webinar format since July, and there's plenty more to come in the months ahead. If you are not already on our listserv, just drop us a note and we'll make sure that you are. Behind the scenes, there are a number of people who make the seminars possible. Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley and Emma Billings of the National History Center. And today we have a number of terrific tech people from the Wilson Center on board. I'd like to thank two institutional supporters, the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest and the George Washington University Department of History, as well as a number of anonymous donors. As always, we invite you to join their ranks. Very briefly on the logistics front, you should know that today's section is being recorded and can be soon found on our institution's respective websites. And when we get to the question and answer section of the webinar, we ask those uh, with questions to use the raise hand function on Zoom. To those watching on Facebook Live, you can email questions to Pete Bierstecker, whose email address will be posted in the chat function uh, on Facebook. And we'll try to call on as many folks as we can. And with that, I will turn the screen over to Christian Osterman, who will be moderating today's session. Christian. Thanks so much, Eric. It's really a great pleasure to welcome and to be able to introduce Professor Francine Hirsch um, to talk about her new book um, here today. Dr. Hirsch is a historian of modern Europe with specialization in Russia and the Soviet Union. And she's the DLS Distinguished Achievement Professor of History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She has published two books, Soviet Judgment at Nuremberg, what we'll talk about today, and Empire of Nations, Ethnographic Knowledge and the Making of the Soviet Union, published in 2005, which examined the role of ethnographers and other former imperial experts in the formation of the Soviet Union. Empire of Nations received two very important awards, the Herbert Baxter Adams Prize of the American Historical Association and the Wayne Vicinich Book Prize of the American Association for Advancement of Slavic Studies. Her new book project focuses on the history of Russian-American entanglement. We'll look at uh, international relations through the lenses of economics, culture, science, and international law. She earned her PhD and master's from Princeton University, is the recipient of numerous fellowships and awards, and they include one from the Wilson Center's Kennan Institute. So we're particularly delighted to welcome her uh, back to the Wilson Center virtually um, as an alumna of uh, this institution. Um, Fran, the Zoom room is yours. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I, I'm really happy to be here today. Um, I'd like to thank the, the Wilson Center, the National History Center, and, and thank you, Christian, um, for inviting me here to talk about my book. And as you said, I got to spend, um, well, I spent a wonderful month at the Kennan Institute when I was starting this project and working in, and in the archives in and around DC. And it's really nice to be back, even if just virtually today. All right, so to begin, uh, the Nuremberg Trials, also known as the International Military Tribunal, or IMT, took place in the wake of World War II from November 1945 to October 1946 in occupied Germany, and we're actually going to be marking the 75th anniversary of the start of the trials next Friday, um, November 20th. The United States, Britain, France, and the Soviet Union tried 22 former Nazi leaders, including Hermann Goering, Rudolf Hess, Johann von Ribbentrop, for conspiracy, crimes against peace, war crimes, and crimes against humanity. And they also tried six Nazi organizations, including the Gestapo and the SS. Well, this was the first of the Nuremberg trials. 
and it would turn out to be the only four power one, although that was not the initial plan. The 12 subsequent Nuremberg trials, including the Einsatzgruppen trial and the judges trial was carried out by the United States alone. And that's one of the reasons I think that um, the Nuremberg tends to be so associated with the United States. Um, the film Judgment at Nuremberg that many people probably have heard of um, was based actually on the judges trial. Um, but there are also other reasons why the Soviet role and the Soviet contribution to Nuremberg um, has largely gone underappreciated. Um, including restricted access to the former Soviet archives, especially during the Cold War, and also concerns about Nuremberg's legacy. Uh, the Soviet role was complicated, let's just say. Um, the Soviets were carrying out deportations in Poland and Hungary, even as the IMT was hearing evidence against the Nazis. And there were episodes in Nuremberg involving the Soviets that everyone, especially the Americans, wanted to forget right away. Um, and this included the Soviet effort to use the IMT to blame one of their own war crimes, the Katyn massacre of thousands of Polish prisoners of war, Polish officers, to blame that on the Nazis. In a more general sense too though, the contribution of Stalin's Soviet Union to the IMT, um, it troubles some people, I think, because it also sort of upends or challenges the myth that I think a lot of people still hold on to of Nuremberg as being kind of fully grounded in liberal ideas about justice and the law. But what I want to argue today and, and what I argue in the book is that we really need the full story. The real Nuremberg story is very messy, right? It's also very interesting. And I also think it's necessary um, but partly because Nuremberg, it still matters. For some people, Nuremberg remains a kind of gold standard of international justice and people still invoke it when talking about the way to do something right. For others, Nuremberg is an appalling example of victor's justice that should never ever be repeated. But if Nuremberg is going to offer any lessons at all, we really do need to understand like what actually happened. So, so hence um, what I try to do in the book. Um, first of all, the first aim of the book is to try to bring the Soviets fully into the picture. And it draws on evidence from five Moscow archives to do this. This evidence includes secret telegrams, letters, diaries, protocols, and in some cases, transcripts of the meetings of two secret Soviet Nuremberg commissions. It includes endless surveillance reports too. The Soviets were informing on each other and writing very detailed reports that they sent back to Moscow. It includes lists of possible witnesses and witness depositions. It also includes um, marked up copies of the indictment and marked up copies of the judgment and other documents that the Soviet delegation secretly smuggled back to Moscow. And these documents, they made their way all the way up the chain of the command to Molotov and to Stalin and all the way back down again. And like for his historian, these documents are incredible because you get to see Molotov and Stalin's comments um, and how they wanted things to go. Okay. Um, so through all of these materials, we get to see the tremendous Soviet contribution to the framework of the trials and also to the prosecution's case. We see Moscow's decision made fairly late in the trials to bring witnesses to Nuremberg to testify about Nazi atrocities, including the planned extermination of Europe's Jews, what of course we now call the Holocaust. Um, but with all this, we also see the many ways in which the Soviet contribution threatened to undermine the IMT's legitimacy. And that's the rub as it is, right? It's, it's both of those things at once. So the book also aims to use the Soviet piece and the Soviet archives combined with US archives and other sources to also tell a, a fuller and more nuanced story of the Nuremberg trials as a whole. And what I argue here is that in really looking at the relationships among all four countries of the prosecution, including the Soviet Union, this really opens things up, right? There were four prosecution teams in Nuremberg. American, British, Soviet, and French. There were four main judges, one representing each country of the prosecution, and they also had alternates. The relationships among the prosecutors, the relationships among the judges, the relationships between the prosecutors and the judges are really just fascinating and, and highly revealing. We see all kinds of clashes, clashes about the meaning of justice, for example. 
and the compromises then that were made on all sides. We also see the importance of the nightlife, uh, the, the tennis matches actually, the parties and the drinking. There was a lot, a lot of drinking that happened. And this isn't just for color actually, it's as a result of the, the the parties and the, the dinners and the drinking, this helped to keep things congenial when the going got tough. And there are certain times it also helped to keep the trials on track. We also see how Nuremberg um, and the Nuremberg courtroom in particular became a front of the Cold War over the course of the trials and how Cold War tensions ultimately in, in some ways helped the defense, I would argue too. All right, so let me, um, let me just say a little bit about the narrative arc. Okay, the book itself um, starts in the darkest days of the war. It covers the road to Nuremberg, focusing on the contentious negotiations about the Nuremberg Charter, which kind of set things up, and the indictment, which laid out all the charges against the defendants, against the accused. It then retells the story of the trials, um, capturing the drama of the prosecution's case, the defense case, the organization's case, and then the judgment which to the dismay of the Soviets resulted in several acquittals and much lighter sentences for some of the defendants than they had anticipated. Uh, it ends with a chapter on the post-war period um, looking at deliberations about international law and human rights and Nuremberg's legacy. Um, so my aim, my aim with the book, um, it really was to tell a good story because I think that again, the, the archival documents, the materials are so rich and, and that's what I wanted to do. And also to introduce readers to a new cast of characters that they wouldn't have met in other books about the Nuremberg trials. Yeah, and in the book, we see, um, we see Nuremberg and the trials through the eyes of people like the Soviet filmmaker, Roman Carmen, the political cartoonist, Boris Efimov and other correspondents. And many of these correspondents had actually been embedded with the Red Army during the war. Some of them had witnessed the liberation of the concentration camps. And they bring all of that with them to the courtroom, that, that experience. And, and they talk about just how difficult it is, the trauma of reliving right, the war um, through their experiences in court. We also see um, the outsized role of Andrei Vyshinsky, who was deputy foreign minister, oh, and so much more. Um, Vyshinsky, Stalin appoints him to head one of the Soviet secret commissions on the Nuremberg trials. And Vyshinsky and Stalin knew each other well because Vyshinsky had been the prosecutor in the Moscow trials of the 1930s, the Moscow show trials. So again, um, it's very suggestive. V Vyshinsky's role in the trials becomes very important even though he's only in Nuremberg once for a very short period of time, okay. Um, along the way, I, I make a number of arguments, and I'll just note three of them here. Um, first of all, without the Soviets and the Soviet push for what they called a special international tribunal, and without Soviet ideas about criminal responsibility, including crimes against peace, right? The, uh, the, um, the criminality of aggressive war and crimes against peace was the Soviet term. Without this, the Nuremberg trials, I would say, likely wouldn't have happened. Something might have happened, but it would have been very different. Second of all, the Soviets had no idea what they had set in motion. And they were greatly handicapped on the international stage um, by the constraints of Stalinism, right? And I argue in the book that the Soviets, they won the war, but at Nuremberg, they lost the victory. Third, by the end of the trials, Nuremberg had become a Cold War battleground. And I think it's really critical that we look at it from this perspective, and this is what we get by fully bringing in the Soviet peace, right? Um, and understanding this um, also gives us a fresh perspective, I think, on understanding what happens after the trials in that post-war moment and in the post-war struggle for human rights. It helps us in part to understand, I think, why Nuremberg's promise, right? the great promise of the Nuremberg principles after, why that promise was never fully realized. And, um, and I, will, I, will, um, I will end there. So, so thank you so much. And thank you again for having me here today. I'm, I'm just really delighted. Thank you, Fran. You succeeded. You tell a really good story. Thanks. Let me just say this is uh, up front before we engage in a little bit of a conversation to which 
uh, Eric and I will invite all of uh, you out there um, in the Zoom world um, in a little bit later in this, this program. Let me just say, this is a marvelous book. It's international history really at its best. It's fresh in archival exploration and insights in its interpretive complications for our understanding of Nuremberg, international justice and post-war international relations. It's also an immensely readable book. I love, I just love how you bring out the dynamics and tensions, especially of course, within the Soviet side. Some of it is almost comical if it wasn't um, serious and, and in many ways tragic. And the dynamics of course, between some pretty big egos on the American side and uh, uh, their Soviet counterparts. So you really bring the story and its leading actors to life. And I think what you've written, at least to me, is really a page turner. So congratulations, Fran. Thank you. Let me, let me start out by, um, since uh, the Wilson Center and its History and Public Policy Program is one of the co-sponsors of the Washington History Seminar, Eric knows what's coming. Uh, let me just begin by a question about archives. Uh, we're the home to the Coltman National History Project's digital archive. And so um, uh, documents and archives are our sweet spot. And I'd love if you could sort of um, let us a little bit into uh, your archival discovery process. Uh, what, were, what were their, you know, what were the turning points perhaps were these surprises that stand out even years later, now that you've finished the book? Oh, thank you. I, lo I love this question. I could talk about archives all day, so you're going to have to stop me at some point. So, um, so I would say when I first, when I knew I wanted to possibly work on this, I started off in GARF, right, the State Archive of the Russian Federation, because that's where the big Nuremberg file is. And so you have the Soviet, you know, the Soviet transcript and a lot of other materials. But one of the most interesting materials I, I found in those first weeks that, that made me know I really wanted to work on this. And that was this incredible um, report home by um, Mikhail Dolgopolov, who was with the Soviet journalist team. He was an informant. A lot of them are informants. So that term, it's hard to say what it means exactly. But he wrote back the seven, a seven page letter. And this was a few weeks in talking about just all the trials and tribulations of what the Soviet delegation was facing there. So he wrote about things, how the Soviet translators and interpreters were not up to the task and how this was causing the Soviet delegation all kinds of problems. He wrote about how the accommodations were, were really terrible as well and, and how they, um, some of the Soviet, they, they had fled the, this kind of smoky kind of room with a malfunctioning heater, for example. Um, they wrote also about the problems that they were having with like public relations in the sense that Dolgopolov writes, all the Americans are showing all of their films to everyone here. Like, why aren't we doing that? Like, and he also, this is heartbreaking, wrote about the fact that the female members of the Soviet delegation, like their clothing was so poor that the Americans and the British were making fun of them. And sort of like saying like, hey, if we're going to send our people to the international stage, we need to think about these kinds of things. And so that document for me, like that was like, okay, like this isn't just a story about the trials, like there's a human story here. And that's when I knew that this was really what I wanted to explore. Um, the, there's, the, there's, I worked in five archives. So, so that was one, some of the things in GARF. In the archive of the Academy of Sciences, I, that was a wonderful place to work. Um, there, they have the papers there of the Institute of Law. And we, we, you know, we've known for a long time that the Soviet jurist Aaron Trainin had a role at Nuremberg, but at the Academy of Sciences, I was able to read through these incredible like 100 page transcripts of the meetings that Trainin was at, where he's putting forward his ideas about the criminality of aggressive law, aggressive war. And what I learned was that the Ministry of Foreign Affairs had turned to the Institute of Law and asked it to investigate this question of the criminality of aggressive war, to investigate the question of the criminal responsibility of the Hitlerites. And so Trianon is responding to a direct request. And so this these reports that he's presenting and there's back and forth, and as you might imagine, right? Andrei Vyshinsky actually attends some of these meetings. And then this is what results in this book, 
the criminal responsibility of the Hitlerites that travels all the way across Europe, that makes its way to the meetings of the United Nations War Crimes Commission, makes its way like, across to the White House and is, is so important. So again, to be able to, to look at those materials there and then to also follow the archival paper trail to how it made its way to the US. So that was really exciting. Um, the, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs archive was just amazing. Um, I mean, so many fantastic materials were there. That's where Vyshinsky's files are and Molotov's files. And it was there that I was able to see all kinds of secret telegrams. I mean, the telegrams were constant. The Soviet delegation was constantly reporting on what was happening with the trials, what was happening with the other members of the Soviet delegation, the things to be aware of, to look out for, and other things too. There was one of my favorite telegrams was a telegram from London when they were working on the Nuremberg Charter. And the informant there writes home and says, uh, we have a problem. You know, Rudenko, who was the, it actually was the, when they were, yeah, Rudenko, he says, doesn't, um, he doesn't seem to know very much about Soviet German relations and Rudenko was a Soviet chief prosecutor. So again, the fact that they had kind of sent him into the situation without all this information, again, th those kinds of documents are great because they also make you ask all kinds of questions, right, about, about what's going on and what's happening behind the scenes. Um, I'll mention a couple more things, but the, the party, I worked also in the party archive um, and I was able to see these letters that um, the Soviet playwright and writer Vsyevolo Vishnevsky was writing home, again, talking about this, the situations and, and the nightlife. And he was really bothered by the nightlife. He really felt that the British and the Americans in particular had no idea what the Soviet people had suffered. And you, you just, so again, those kinds of materials were great. And um, and oh, and also in the in the archive of um, Russian art and literature, um, I was able to read through diaries and and letters again of people like Vishnevsky and the filmmaker Roman Carmen. And again, you really just see things unfolding through their eyes, which was so important too. So I mean, it's funny the things I'm talking about here. It's not as much the the ins and outs of the trials like that was really interesting to study as well. But the material that really spoke to me as I was getting into the project were the materials that, that really let me see also the, the human side of things and, and all of these interactions and just to get a sense of like, who were these people that the Soviets sent to Nuremberg, right? Like, what are they coming with? What are they experiencing there? And, um, and to me, that's what made it such an interesting story. But, but the, I, again, I, I can go, there, there's just, um, the archives are great. And, and I'll just say one more thing, which is that, being able to read those kinds of materials against materials from US archives. For example, like Jackson's diaries are in the Library of Congress and they are amazing, amazing. And so to look at Jackson, Jackson's reactions to things and compare that with the Soviet reactions and to read things against each other, right? That's that's the, the, the beauty of archival research. And to look at Maxwell Davis, Davis fight, the deputy, the British deputy chief prosecutor. So Jackson's US chief prosecutor and um, David Maxwell Fife is the British deputy chief prosecutor. And again, just to see how all these people are in the same room and describing the same situation, um, it, it was just, it was really fun to work on. It was really fun. Fantastic. If for, Quick follow up here. Are there any collections or topics that you could not really get archival closure on? Yes. Yeah, there, there always are. Um, and I think, you know, it's interesting. So there are a few things. Um, one of them is Katine, right? Which there's a lot that I that I was able to see. Um, there are things that other scholars were able to see and that I was able to, there was some, there's a really good document collection that was really helpful to me as well. But then there is still like, there's a question um, that someone just asked me recently, which is, like, do we know at what point, um, like what Moscow said to Nikachenko, like what happened? Because so well, we can talk about, so Katyn anyway, well, this, this massacre that the Soviets try to get in there. Um, they, they, they argue for the inclusion of this crime that they themselves have committed. And then um, at the end, it gets dropped from the judgment. And I would love to know like who said what to, to, to Soviet judge Nikachenko. So that's one of the things that I think is, um, is still like a, a pretty big open question. Great, thank you. So when we think about the, the Nuremberg war crimes trials, 
we often focus on its lasting influence on international law of justice. But one of the things that struck me most about your book um, uh, was that Nuremberg was also, and for the contemporaries, perhaps first and foremost, a struggle over the narrative of World War II and Nazism. If you can talk a little bit about this um, point, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. So um, it was absolutely a struggle over the narrative of the war and of the rise of Nazism. And I think one of the things that um, that I found really interesting going when I was doing this research um, was seeing how much it was a struggle over the narrative among the victors, right, among the countries of the prosecution and how even on the eve of the trial before it started. And a lot of this came out in the deliberations about the indictment, right? The indictment was actually a massive document, massive document. I didn't just list the charges, it laid out all the charges in great detail and also um, included a very detailed history of the war. And each victor wanted to tell a somewhat different story. Each wanted to omit different things. The Soviets, um, they wanted to fully play down the Soviet-German non-aggression pact of August 1939. Like, I'm not even talking about the secret protocols here, but the pact itself even. They were concerned that that non-aggression pact would be seen as a springboard for the invasion of Poland. The French and the British, they wanted to play down the Munich Pact of September 38, um, in which they had turned their backs on Czechoslovakia. So those things are playing out. And again, um, I, I could see this like through Moscow, through all the correspondence between Moscow and Nuremberg, where Moscow's like just saying, you can't let this in, right? and, and just directing the Soviets about what they should do about this. Um, interestingly, the, so the prosecutors, they all agree on the eve of the trials that the trials are only going to focus on European Axis crimes. They even go further than that, though, in their quiet meetings. Um, they agree that it's not just that only European Axis crimes will be tried, but the prosecutors agree that they're going to keep the trials. And like they're, uh, the whole thing just focused on European access crime. And the fact that, they, that they're gonna try to keep their own war crimes, anything uncomfortable out of the courtroom. And this is actually at Jackson's initiative, the US chief prosecutor, he suggests that they all submit lists of things that they wanna keep out of the courtroom. And the Soviets, they work on their own list of, they don't admit to any crimes in it, but what they would consider taboo topics. The thing is, is that the prosecutors all agreed on this, but the judges didn't, right? And the Western judges, um, they become very, very concerned about accusations of victor's justice. And all the more concerned because the Soviet judge, Yona Nikachenko, he just is very clear that he thinks that they're all guilty and should hang. And so the Western judges, um, they really push back against this, maybe even going further than they would have otherwise. And they end up giving significant leeway to the defendants and, um, and what happens then, so we have this struggle over the narrative among the prosecutors, of the countries, and we also have then the defendants using the courtroom to put forward their own narrative of the rise of Nazism and the rise of the war as well. And one of the really big things is one of the charges, of course, it's, uh, it's crimes against peace, the criminality of a war of aggression. And so one of the big pushbacks is arguing that the war was not an aggressive war, that it was a quote unquote preventive war. And, um, and so they, they, the defense works really hard to, to try to push this narrative through. And the Soviet judge, um, Yona Nikachenko, has very little success actually in court at shutting some of this down. You know, the defendants go on for a very long time. Thank you. One of the... Uh, most important, perhaps the most important contribution of your book um, to me is giving us a much richer understanding of Soviet approaches to post-war justice, international law, the Soviet contribution to the legal framing of the Nuremberg Charter. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this, especially you alluded to, uh, to his role already, the role of uh, Aaron Training. Yeah, sure. Um, I, so I guess just to start, it, I would say that again, the. The Soviets are starting to think about war crimes and how to deal with them and war criminals very early on in the war. In, in April 1942, um, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Molotovs, creates a special commission to evaluate the international law um, perspective on reparations. 
And that's how Aaron Trainin gets pulled into things from the start at the Institute of Law. Um, and part of the reason the Soviets want to do this is because Nazi atrocities are just so terrible and the, the devastation in the Soviet Union by this point. Um, so there's just a, a sense of needing to deal with this. Um, then in October 42, Molotov calls publicly for a special international tribunal and invites all interested governments to cooperate in bringing the Nazi leaders to justice. Um, the US and the British, they're pretty slow to come on board. The US is worried about reprisals against allied prisoners of war. The British think, well, like, why should we have trials? They actually think that an executive order, an executive decree would be um, much more effective and that the crimes of the Nazis are too great to deal with um, by some kind of a trial. So the Soviets at this point, they're kind of walking their own path. They have their own war crimes commission, the Extraordinary State Commission. They don't participate in the United Nations War Crimes Commission. But what's happening all the while is Aaron Trainin, who had started working on these questions in April 1942, when the Ministry of Foreign Affairs kind of came to him and his colleagues. He's starting to talk about, again, the criminal responsibility of the Hitlerites. He's writing lots of articles and what will eventually become this book, talking about the criminality of aggressive war and how crimes against peace, it's not just that they're wrong or illegal, but that these are punishable crimes. And that was the thing that had been sort of left unclear earlier at, with in deliberations and the Kellogg-Briand Pact. And so there is uncertainty, is this illegal? Is this not really illegal? And I'll just say here too, that the Soviets, they were not concerned about ex post facto or retroactive law, they had no problem with it. And so with the Soviets eventually being one of the four countries at the table and the Nuremberg Charter being based on law from all four countries, right? That was one way to kind of get this in. So that's pretty significant too. Trainin, um, it's crimes against peace. He also makes a, a very important arguments about conspiracy and complicity. Um, here too, drawing upon um, writings that he had done earlier with the Moscow trial. So that's kind of this interesting history to it. And he also makes arguments against the defense of superior orders, right? The defense that I'm just following orders. So he, um, he really brings that to the table as well. And so, you know, Trainin, he's really at the forefront. And again, lots of people are talking about aggressive war, but it's his ideas and his formulation that kind of make their way through. And, and it's part of why Trainin is one of the people who sent along with um, Yona Nikachenko to the negotiations in London um, for the writing of the London Charter, the Nuremberg Charter, it's called both. And that's part of why crimes against peace ends up being one of the, the formulations in Article 6 of one of the main, um, one of the main counts. Thank you. What, why Nuremberg and not Berlin? Why, why Nuremberg as the site for the, the tribunal? Yeah, the Soviets are still at, no, the Soviets were asking that for long after that happened. No. Um, so initially, the Soviets were pushing very hard for Berlin. And, and Stalin wanted Berlin, right? Molotov is insisting on Berlin. Berlin, while not part of the Soviet zone, is physically within the Soviet zone, right? The site of the Nazi capitulation in the east, the home of the Allied occupation government. The Americans were pushing very hard for Nuremberg. Um, they talked about it as being important because it was the birthplace of the Nazi movement, but they, they really wanted the control of it being in Nuremberg as well. They wanted to be in charge of the communications. They wanted to be in charge of food supply. There are actually some really interesting like memos about this as well. Um, and the Soviets, um, this is one of the issues that they compromise on. They compromise on it in August 1945, right at the tail end of the London conference, right after Potsdam. Um, and, and part of why they compromise it, it's part of it's logistical and financial. They realize that it's going to be pretty expensive to hold these trials. And there's talk about like billing the Nazis for it after, but it's really not clear. Like someone's going to have to lay out this money up front. And they understand that if they have it in Nuremberg, if they do agree to this, that the Americans will pay for it. Um, at least initially, and the Americans will handle the logistics. But the other thing is, is that they really think they're getting something important in return. Um, it's agreed that Berlin will be the permanent seat of the IMT and that the Soviet judge will preside 
at the opening ceremony, the opening sessions at this permanent seat in Berlin. And so they're comfortable with that, right? The Americans can pay for stuff and, um, and they can still have, have this experience of presiding. But there's another thing too, which is that again, people, they, the idea at the time is that there'll be multiple Nuremberg trials, right? And that there'll be multiple four power trials. And that initially it's talked about that this will be something that will rotate. They, the first one will be in Nuremberg and then they'll decide where the next one will be. And if Berlin is going to be the, the permanency and the Soviets, right, then they're getting that as well. So um, of course that didn't play out that way, but yeah. Thank you. I think somewhere you write that the politics of this huge, huge indictment um, that you've already talked about were really about the politics of history. Yes. Could you unpack that a little bit more? And I would love for you, and, Again, you already alluded to that in your opening remarks, but talk a bit about Katim. I think that's very central to this. And, um, you know, I've, I, I've, I learned a lot about Katim just, just uh, from its role at the trials, uh, which wasn't, uh, hadn't been clear to me um, as somebody who knew uh, about the um, massacre and its role, but what, is, what, what a central role it played um, in Nuremberg, um, I think is a is a fascinating aspect of it of, of your story. Thanks. So uh, let me I want to say kind of at, at at the at the start too that um, in in order to even understand what the Soviets think they're going to be doing with Katyn, um, and then I'll describe what Katyn is as well. But I, what their expectations are for what Nuremberg is going to be, right? Um, and what their aims are. The Soviets take Nazi guilt as a given. There's no question. They are expecting guilty verdicts down the line, right? They are expecting hangings. This is the trial that's going to happen before the hangings. And, and that's really how they're viewing at it. They see it as an opportunity to demonstrate Nazi guilt, to relate Soviet suffering and Soviet heroism. They did not expect the defendants to take the stand. They did not expect the defendants to be able to call witnesses, right? They expected that the evidence presented by a national war crimes tribunal, I mean, national war crimes commission rather, including their own um, in the extraordinary state commission and then the commission that they set up to investigate Katyn, they expect because of something called article 21 in the charter that states that evidence presented by national war crimes commissions that, that's incontrovertible they interpreted incontrovertible to mean that it could just not be challenged, period, right? And of course, that was not the case. So these aims and expectations shape their personnel as well. Um, almost all members of the Soviet legal team, um, they were involved in the Soviet show trials. Um, the judge, Yona Nikachenko, the Soviet chief prosecutor, Roman Rudenko, right? So that's part of what's going on as well. And they also think that they will fully be able to control the script, which is just really naive when we think about it. But, but again, so that's part of why they didn't bother to initially tell Rudenko about the secret protocols to the Soviet German non-aggression pact in which Hitler and Stalin agreed to divide up Europe. And it's also why they thought it would be easy to include the Katyn massacre on, in the indictment, right? as a Nazi crime when in fact it was a Soviet crime. So, so this massacre, just to kind of then go back to the beginning, as, as we now know, like now that we have the evidence that this was a massacre that was committed by the Soviets, right? In the spring of 1940, I believe before the, before the German occupation of the Soviet Union. And, um, and so the Soviets commit this massacre and they, the, the Germans found the grave and the graves and blamed it on the Soviets. This was still during the war. And it was this kind of political hot potato that was being kind of tossed back and forth with blame, counter blame. And by the end, of, at the end of the war, the Soviets thought, okay, the Nazis have been defeated. This is gonna be easy now. Now we can just like make it stick. And we know from the archives um, that the Soviets had actually been considering holding their own separate show trial in occupied Poland just for Katyn. And then this is one of those things I wish I knew, like exactly who whose bright idea was it, but but someone had the idea up at the top, like in one of the, the, 
either in Smirsh or which is in one of the counterintelligence agencies anyway, someone decided, no, let's just like bring it into Nuremberg. And so we see it being introduced as this, this again, this crime that the Soviets had committed, this massacre of thousands, I think the, the, the numbers vary, but probably more than 20,000, right? Polish um, prisoners of war, a massacre the Soviets had committed. Now the Soviets insist during the writing of the indictment and all of the back and forth of the indictment, they insist on including it as a German war crime. And first they just put it in there, right? And then the other Western prosecutors are just like, uh, are you sure you wanna do this? Uh, do we have good evidence of this? Even if it's the case that this has already been such a political issue that, it, you know, we do really want this back and forth. And R Roman Rodenko, the Soviet chief prosecutor who's engaged in these deliberations about the indictment, he says, my hands are tied. Like Stalin wants it in there. Um, if, if you don't want it in there, I'm going to have to go back to Moscow. I'm going to have to talk to Stalin personally. This is going to take a few weeks. And the Western prosecutors um, at that point, they, they, let it, they let it go. And again, this is like to emphasize that it's not, at this point, people, the, the, there's evidence, um, the governments have, we now know that the governments have evidence that British and American leaders had evidence about Soviet responsibility. It's not clear how much the prosecutors knew. My sense, again, from reading the various documents against each other, is that Jackson, again, the US chief prosecutor, Maxwell Fife, British deputy chief prosecutor who were engaged in these negotiations, they had very strong suspicions but there was nothing like definitive. And so it goes in, hmm. the indictment is published. The very day after the indictment is published, Jackson gets secret intelligence. I found this kind of, again, reading some, uh, this again, some information from the Cornell archives actually in the Donovan Connect collection that Jackson gets information saying, uh, yeah, we're, we're pretty, we're almost positive the Soviets did it. Like we have some evidence now and it's too late. It's too late. And so there's a, you know, there's this, the kind of, he's advised to try to talk to Rudenko. Maybe Rudenko will just like not talk about it and just kind of let it go. But the Soviets are not going to let it go. And then during the Soviet case in February, the Soviet deputy chief prosecutor, Yuri Prokhorovsky, is the one who presents the falsified evidence of Katyn. Again, the Soviets, the, the, the defense is petitioning for evidence. Gehring's attorney is petitioning for evidence, and um, and the judges decide they're they're going to allow it. Um, that they're going to allow. So so what the decision is, and it, again, uh, just like Nikichenko, who okay. just um, they're just three to one, three to one, three to one. They're outvoting him like down the line on this. Um, that they're going to allow the defense to call three witnesses for a Katyn, but they're also going to allow the Soviets to call three witnesses for a Katyn. And this happens at the very tail end of things in July. It's kind of one of the last big things of the trial. And it's, um, it's pretty inconclusive, actually. Um, one of the tricky things is that the defense is not, uh, the, the, the Soviets are not on trial. So, the, so their defense isn't allowed to try to make a case that the Soviets are guilty. The defense is in the position of just presenting evidence to show that they're innocent. And a lot of it really comes down to uh, like, when did it actually take place kind of thing. Right. Um, in, in the very end, right, it gets pulled from the judgment. Um, and that, that's what I wanna know more about. So if anyone out there has more information about that, let me know. Um, but yeah, that's, um, it's, it's a low point. It's, it's a low point for the Soviets. It's a low point for everyone, right? That this should have ever been allowed to get in there. It threatens the legitimacy of the, the trials. It threatens the legacy of the trials. I mean, that and the secret protocols, I think are the two, the, the, what, two of the most important reasons, again, why um, the Soviets are kind of left out of a lot of the narrative about the Nuremberg trials when we want to tell this uplifting story because there's just nothing uplifting about that. Thank you. It's absolutely fascinating. I've, I've only gotten through the first few of a long list of questions, but time is running away. And I want to invite Eric Arneson to join the conversation. And then we'll also want to open it up for a Q&A with our audience. Eric. Thank you, Christian. So 
I want to use Katine as a way of kind of opening up the larger question of, of legal culture. You've talked about uh, the legal theoretical contributions that the Soviets made, but the, I guess in retrospect, the audacity of trying to pin Katine on the Germans uh, and all of the efforts that they undertook on the ground, you know, to plant evidence, to bring in outsiders, to pin this on, on the Nazis, um, kind of suggests a certain, well, lack of sophistication and or a sense of nuance with regard to uh, evidence uh, and its interrogation. And so what struck me uh, in reading this uh, is the clash or the difference in legal cultures uh, between the American, British, and to a lesser extent French, uh, and the Soviet uh, prosecutors uh, and legal folks. Uh, if your main background uh, is the Soviet show trials of the 1930s, um, as you point out, cross-examination is not the Soviet specialty. Right, you know, you've got witnesses. They've been beaten. They've been tortured. They've been coached. They read their script, uh, and the outcome is determined before you even start. So the Soviets show up in Nuremberg, and they don't know how to cross uh, interrogate or, or cross examine witnesses. So if you could just talk a bit more uh, about the the differences in legal culture uh, that, in particular, I think put the Soviets at a real disadvantage. Uh, going into and through the trial and how they learned over time uh, from especially their American and their British counterparts? That's a great question. A Soviet legal culture, first of all, I would say it's complicated because on the one hand, you have people like Aaron Trainen at the Institute of Law, right? Who were educated in Western European legal traditions, who were part of international conversations about international law, um, Trainen like spoke many languages. He himself had studied in Germany for a time. So, so there is a certain legal culture that we would recognize as a legal culture that that right. So, so there's that right. At the same time as there's that legal culture, there's also the show trial culture, um, and that's where where you have again um, that's and that the again it's the decision to send people from this show trial culture, the decision to send Nikachenko and Rudenko who did not have experience abroad, who th that's what they were, they were good at show trials. And, and so that's part of what's going on. So that's kind of one part of the question. Um, at the same time, there are these just sort of, there are different expectations about what a trial is supposed to look like. That's right, the Americans and the British, uh, that's more of the common law system, which is more adversarial, um, where the prosecutor is expected to like, present the evidence, the judge is expected to be sort of an outsider, unbiased, coming to things fresh, right? In the civil system, it's more inquisitorial, the system of the Soviets and the French. In that system, the indictment contains all of the evidence, so it's examined ahead of time, whereas um, there's much more of in, in the in the common law system is much more presenting the evidence as part of the trial and that's why cross examination is so important. So for the, the French and the Soviets then coming from this other system that's more inquisitorial, the Soviets have different expectations about what role the judge is going to have. They're shocked at this idea that the judges are supposed to be really like neutral parties and they, they think the case has already been made right in the indictment and now it's just putting it forward and deciding on this sentences. So that's part of what's happening there. At the same time, again, like the civil law, common law, that's all very well and good, but the Soviets have their whole, a whole other thing going on, right, as well. Um, again, like with, with the show trials, with the role of Vyshinsky. Um, and so they, they are, I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, it's audacious and, and what they try to do and they're incredibly unprepared. In terms of the cross-examination, it's there are parts of it that are, um, well, it's sad and almost comical at the same time in the sense that some of the, the archival evidence, you actually see them, they, 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 they know that there's gonna be some back and forth. So they write out the questions that they're planning to ask. Um, and they even, they, they give Jackson one of these sheets at some point for someone that he's gonna cross-examine. And he's just like, no, I don't need this, thank you. So they write out the questions um, along with the anticipated answers 
And, and then like, what do you do when you don't get the anticipated answer, right? How do you, how do you go on the fly with this? And so there's that part. And there's also, this is also so important. The, the Soviet delegation, they're afraid, right? That's part of, and that's just not the legal culture. That's the culture of Stalinism. They're afraid. They're, first of all, they're not allowed to make decisions on the fly, on their own. All of the other delegations have just a, a lot more um, autonomy. Like they can be more flexible. Yeah, sure, they're checking in. Jackson's checking in with Truman. Early on, he's checking in with the OSS and with Army Intelligence. There's back and forth. But, but the Soviet delegation, they are on you know, just a short chain. And they, that's part of why they're constantly smuggling documents back because they need approval. They, they're afraid to go forward without approval. And there are moments where they do go forward without approval and then you know, they're, they're called back and um, they, 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 they're in big trouble. Um, so so that's, that's part of it too. It's really difficult to operate this way on an international stage when, again, not just the legal culture, but your whole culture is, is so very different in that way. Just to, if you could just amplify um, um, one of the things that you, you just said, because what struck me in the book is the complete and utter lack of autonomy uh, that the Soviet prosecutors had. So everything has to be cleared with Moscow, and or with Stalin himself. Um, and similarly, the prosecutors don't actually have the knowledge that they need going in. So they're not aware of the secret protocols on the non-aggression pact. They're not aware necessarily of uh, the Katyn massacre and their actual responsibility. So they're kind of kind of driving, you know, without a roadmap to a certain extent, and then a roadmap is handed to them uh, from, from Moscow. So how does that kind of affect, well, I guess my question answers itself, how it, how it affects you know, their, their ability to, to do this job. If you could just say a little bit more about that control. Yeah, it, it makes things incredibly complicated for them. I mean, early on in the trial, well, first of all, like documents get lost. Like, they're not supposed to be sending some of these documents back. And so they're, they're smuggling it back through different channels. It takes time, things get lost in transit. And then when things get lost, they're left stalling. So there's a moment early on where they come up with this whole excuse that the Soviet chief prosecutor has malaria um, and that they have to delay the start of the trial. And that's because they haven't gotten their instructions in time, right? So that's part of what's going on there. Um, later, I mean, they're, they're always like five steps behind because they're always waiting for these instructions. And by the time that they they get these instructions, everyone else has moved on. And that's what's really difficult too. The, a big thing is the judgment. So, you know, there's all, it, when you read the Western books, um, like some amazing Western books, right? Uh, uh, about the Western, you know, the narrative of the trial, some of the classics, um, they talk about how the judges are all like sequestered and they make a really big deal about how every day they burn the trash so that everything will be very private and controversial. I don't know. Nikachenko managed to smuggle out an entire draft of the judgment and the verdicts that made its way back to Moscow and all the way up the chain of command. And then he gets back, I don't know, like a 12 or 15 page list of instructions about, again, like, because they're furious in Moscow when they find out that there aren't going to be guilty verdicts down the line and that there are going to be some lighter sentences, perhaps. And so, you know, instructions about, you know, how to try to convince the judges that you have to make Lawrence, who's the, the British judge and the president of the tribunal, Jeffrey Lawrence, you have to make him understand that the world will not stand for a soft judgment. And, um, and so, but again, by the time that Nikachenko gets this, because you know, there's no, there's no internet, right? It's just like weeks, it, it's too late, it's gone. Like that ship has sailed, those decisions have been made. And so um, again, that, that expectation of being able to confer, you know, the one time that that's the, the, the big moment, there's one time that Vyshinsky comes to Nuremberg in November. And that is at the very beginning of the trials, about five days in, um, because this is after London when they told him that like, hey, Rudenko doesn't know about the secret protocols. Rudenko doesn't know about the whole history of German-Soviet relations. He doesn't even really know about the history of the war. Um, and so Vyshinsky shows up in Nuremberg. He's there for a few days. Now remember, he's the head of a secret commission. 
Like no one's supposed to know that he's even involved in the trials. He's in Nuremberg like, as an honored guest as deputy foreign minister. But there are these, you know, he holds some meetings with everyone and that's when he, he basically fills them in and explains to them. So, so that helps for a little while. Um, but, but no, it's, um, it's, it's crazy really just this it's so yeah it's, it's about the legal systems but it's it's so it's so much more than that um and and they they really you know I should say too like they realize they they learn how to certain things along the way like they get better at this um but not better enough I would say as well thank you um let's open it up um to questions um perhaps ask one more question but encourage um, our audience to use the uh, raise hand function to signal that you'd like to ask a question or um, uh, use the uh, chat function on Facebook to um, uh, uh, send us a question or email a question to Peter Bierstecker uh, at the Wilson Center. Um, Fran, Stalin, what was his role in all of this? I mean, is he the, the elephant in the room? Pretty much. Um, so, so Stalin is, um, he's watching things pretty carefully. I'd say at the very start of the trials, um, maybe not as much, or before the trials begin, like while they're working on the indictment, there's a trial that at the time that where Stalin's um, like kind of recovering from, you know, exhaustion or illness. And so the, he's, he's not as much involved, but, but then um, by November, December, by, by the, by early, just by December, I would say he's following things much more closely. And in January, um, during, during the winter break, when the members of the Soviet delegation, um, some of them, some of them stay in Nuremberg to work on things and some of them are called back to Moscow. And it's at that point, this is again, one of those other things that I wish I had more information on. Like we have, we have the, the list of who Stalin received, right? We know he received Rudenko twice. Um, we know what happened afterwards in terms of how Rudenko and the, the Soviet delegation started to adjust and change the Soviet case, right? Expanding it, bringing in new evidence, um, making a decisions to, to call in eyewitnesses. That's Stalin's doing, right? That's the, that, but that's pretty much, you, know, you can see it from the meetings of the Politburo Commission and the way that it cycles down. I, I wish I knew what they actually said in that office together, but he's, he's watching the whole thing and um, taking, taking notes, I would say as well. Thank you. All right, let's go to uh, Eva Ahrens. If you could please um, unmute yourself. Please unmute yourself. You're still muted as far as I can tell. Well, always always a bit of a problem let's let's go to to one of the questions um, in the um, uh, in the uh, chat room um, uh, and perhaps uh, Eva can can uh, resolve the technical issue um, question from Michael Binder were the indictments evenly balanced between crimes committed in Western Europe and Eastern Europe or did the fact of three Western powers judges, and only one Eastern power judge skewed a trial more towards the judgment of crimes committed against the West. I, I would say that it was it was evenly balanced, um, and that in fact um, there were there was a, a significant amount of evidence um, uh, about crimes committed in Eastern Europe and, and the Soviet Union. One of the things that's I think interesting that unfolds during the trial. So the, the way that the the case is divided up. Um, the Americans and Jackson ends up introducing a new count conspiracy. Um, and so the Americans present on conspiracy. The, so the, the British present on crimes against peace. And then the Soviets and the French divide war crimes and crimes against humanity with the French presenting on war crimes and crimes against humanity in Western Europe and the Soviets presenting on war crimes and crimes against humanity in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. But one of the things that happens is because the evidence is just so horrible of, of war crimes and crimes against humanity in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, when Jackson is presenting the case on conspiracy, um, the Americans actually end up presenting a lot of that evidence. 
um, much, and the Soviets are, they're not sure how to feel about that, right? On the one hand, they're glad that this is being presented, but on the other hand, um, they, they, they're a little worried that the whole trial is going to turn into an American show, that they themselves had been planning on presenting some of this really powerful evidence. That's part of when, when Rudenko comes back to, um, to Moscow in January, that's my sense is that that's part of the discussions and why they start pulling in new evidence as well, evidence that the Americans um, and the British and the French um, didn't have and weren't able to present. Thank you. Uh, let me call on Jeff Herf. Jeff, if you could please unmute yourself. Yeah, the book sounds fascinating. And I look forward to reading it. Uh, uh, Hartley Shawcross uh, at the trial uh, uh, spoke a great deal about the crimes against the Jews. And I, 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 was, I, uh, I entered this, the webinar a bit late, so you may have spoken about this. Um, uh, how did Rodenko respond and uh, did the Soviet team uh, discuss how to address the, the, the persecution of the Jews and the Holocaust? So thank you. So it's one of, one of the myths about Nuremberg in some ways that the Soviets didn't talk about the Holocaust or the crimes against the Jews. And that has to do in part with Soviet war crimes trials before Nuremberg, at which they referred to crimes against all peaceful citizens instead of in cases where the, the victims were clearly Jewish. And it has to do with what happened after Nuremberg as well with um, the anti-cosmopolitan or anti-Semitic anti campaign. But at the trials, um, especially in their presentations on crimes against humanity, humanity the Soviets presented um, very clear and compelling evidence of the crimes against the Jews. Um, Lev Smirnov was the Soviet prosecutor who was in charge of that case. And um, I mean, the, the evidence, it's, it's terrible and shocking. And it, it's really all about um, these plans for extermination that were carried out. Um, not just that, but when the Soviets make the decision to bring in witnesses, they decide to bring in witnesses like Paulus, right, who they have imprisoned, but they also decide to bring in eyewitnesses. And one of the most powerful eyewitnesses they bring in is the Yiddish poet Avraham Sutskever, who testifies in the trial um, about, again, the extermination of, of the Jews um, in, in Vilna, um, talking about it, bringing in some general evidence. Sutskever had worked with Ilya Ehrenberg um, after he was rescued and airlifted out um, on the Black Book. He putting together evidence of German crimes against Jews. And then he testifies in person using some of this evidence, but really even more talking about his own personal experience and the murder of his son. And so, so there's... There's a, if you go through the transcript, there's, there's quite a lot about the Holocaust that's, that's in the transcript as, as part of the Soviet case. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. A uh, question from Michael David Fox, Georgetown. Hi, Fran, you mentioned Katyn in your presentation. Can you elaborate on the Soviet attempt to blame the Germans for the 1940 massacre and how this figures in your broader account? Did the testimony of the deputy mayor of Smolensk, Basilevsky, play a significant role? You've already talked about Katyn, so I think we, that question is largely taken care of, but perhaps the testimony of the deputy mayor of Smolensk, Basilevsky, and his- Yeah, his hi, hi, Michael. I know, I know Smolensk is, is near and dear to your heart. Um, so, I mean, yes, I mean, the, the Soviet, I would say that, again, how, how much of any of that testimony, quote unquote, mattered, right, in the sense that, um, Bezalewski had been very well prepped ahead of time. Um, he was one of the witnesses that what the Soviets actually brought a bunch of journalists to the gravesite in January 45 in order to just, like prove their point even earlier about Nazi guilt. And Bezalewski was part of that whole show as well. Um, and so, you know, he does as expected, right? Um, but it's I would say it's, it's none of the Soviet testimony is enough to um, to undo kind of the suspicions that the Soviets are lying. Thank you. A question from Dan Caldwell. An estimated two million German women were raped by Soviet troops. Was this crime against humanity ever discussed at Nuremberg? So again, that is one of the things about Nuremberg. It was decided at the very start that it was going to be limited to European Axis crimes. And so none of the war crimes, crimes against humanity, anything com committed by 
any of the victors. Um, none of that was, was discussed at all in the trial. Um, but I would say, again, that's part of this question, this part of what complicates, again, the story of Soviet involvement. And that's part of what complicated it at the time and, and after the fact. Um, yeah, I mean, people understood that the Soviets, that, yeah, I'll, I'll let it stop it there. But it, it's, 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 it's difficult, it's a difficult topic, yeah. Question from Eric Lohr. Could you say a little bit more about what you learned about the four contrasting attitudes towards cultures and procedures of law and prosecution? To what degree did the Soviets there understand or misunderstand the three legal cultures they encountered? Were all the divisions three to one or did the Soviet side ever get support? So this builds on Eric's earlier, Eric Arneson's earlier question. Yeah, so um, I would say, Again, the Soviets and the French are much closer and much more in agreement about a lot of things in terms of, again, how things should play out. A lot of the legal culture questions come up in London during work on the charter, the framework of the trials, right? Once that's set up, it's kind of there in writing what things are supposed to look like. Those deliberations are incredibly interesting because it's like, what is an indictment? How do you understand an indictment, right? And it's clear that they understand an indictment to be a very different thing. Like, what is the role of a judge in a trial? Um, it's clear they understand that to be different as well. Um, the thing, in terms of cross-examination, though, um, the French do pretty well at that, right? It's it's the Soviets who, who really have the hardest time. And, um, and again, I would say that's not so much because of Soviet legal culture as much as it is the people who they've sent to Nuremberg, right? Um, and, and the show trial culture that they themselves have come out of. Thank you. There's, there's another question from Eric Lohr. Um, since Eric Arneson posed in part his, his earlier question, how did the Soviet experience at Nuremberg compare to East German trials? collaboration trials elsewhere in the USSR and Eastern Europe. Have you looked at that? So I have not studied that in detail. Do you wanna elaborate how it would compare in, in what respect? Well, you would have, we would have to get Eric Lohr online. Right. Eric, why don't you raise your hand then uh, uh, in, in the chat room, I can call on you and we can engage you. But there's Eric. All right, if you can unmute yourself. Great, Eric, now you can ask your own question. <laughs> okay, well, I, I don't actually know uh, the history of uh, East Germany uh, and trials in East Germany, uh, but uh, I read Ben Frommer's book about uh, the collaboration trials in Czechoslovakia, and it just raised the question whether, you know, there was any impact or learning from the Nuremberg experience on uh, these other trials, yeah. Okay, well, I, saw, I think that the, the way to answer this question in part is to, again, emphasize how unusual Nuremberg was, right? There were war crimes trials that were being carried out by all of the victors. Um, the British were carrying out war crimes trials. The American military was carrying out war crimes trials. The Soviets were carrying out their own war crimes trials, as were the French. And um, so what was very different about Nuremberg was that you have the coming together of these four countries with these four different legal cultures with the, from these four different governments, also with these four very different experiences of the war. And so in some ways that keeps things in check in a way that's different from other Soviet war crimes trials, I would say that the Soviets, um, you know, had the Soviets been carrying out the Nuremberg trials, Kachi never would have been questioned, right? Um, and what happens with some later trials in the Soviet Union, and from my understanding on in reading the work of, of scholars who have worked on Eastern Europe, is that part of why it's so difficult to study some of those other trials is that you have people on trial who, some who actually have, were collaborators, right, and committed war crimes trials, and then others who are, had not, or we don't know that they had, but they're on trial because um, they're seen as political enemies for other reasons, and then they're accused of being collaborators. And so, you know, that doesn't happen at Nuremberg, right? That's one of the ways, I think, in which Nuremberg is really unique. Thank you. Question from David Gerber. Given what you have said about Soviet defensiveness in the face of the intricacies of striving for justice at Nuremberg, what was the Soviet response to the judges' trial? I know that 
process was an American matter, but nonetheless, the ide ideological corruption of justice, of a justice system, the charge against the German judges could certainly have been made against judges in the Soviet system regarding the show trials, which went on at many levels of society for years. It is not an international matter such as crimes against peace, but ultimately involved the crimes of the domestic judicial system against uh, itself, against its citizens. That seems very close to home for Soviet judges, doesn't it? That's a really interesting question. I, I, the Soviets um, were not fo following, at least so far as I know, some of the details of what happened in the subsequent Nuremberg trials that they themselves were involved in, except for the industrialist trial, right? That's the one that, that they were very upset about. That's the one that they, they thought that there were light sentences. And that's the one that they talked about. Um, Again, the, the, any that's really the only one that they ones that they talked about were all the industrialist trials they they thought were like a farce and that they thought that they were too light because they thought the Americans had been in cahoots with the Germans and that's why the Americans didn't want there to be more four power trials. But they don't. So far as I have seen, I haven't seen a dis their discussion of the judges' trial at all. Although it would be interesting back in the Soviet Union afterwards. Um, there are all these anti-corruption trials against Soviet judges, and Nikachenko actually gets swept up in that. But that's um, that's a, it's a really different story and not comparable. Another another question in the um, the Q and A uh, function: uh, Given the objections by lawyers to the Nuremberg trials based on ex post facto law and other reasons, were the trials valid? Oh, that's one of those questions that um, right were they valid? Um, sometimes people ask me if they were just or if they were fair, were they valid? It's a, what, it depends on like what, cri what criteria. Again, if you're bringing together four different countries, if you're saying that a country is based on the law of four different legal systems and that you're going to bring it together and you're going to allow in some charges and you can say that we can have some ex post facto because one of the countries doesn't have a problem with ex post facto, then in terms of the, like the structure that's been set up around this particular trial, I would say they, you know, I, I don't know valid, not valid, they would say that it was valid. One of the really interesting things about ex post facto, I would say too, is that um, I, I, there's a whole bunch of OSS reports that were filed um, right around the time where they were thinking about doing a Nuremberg's trial. And one of the, and I, I, I saw those in the Library of Congress archive, they're amazing. Then some of them are in, in the Jackson files. And, um, and in these reports, the OSS is talking at length about this ex post facto question and about the fact that the Soviets, it's not a problem for them. And so that, so that works its way in. I would say that that's, it's, it's a consideration, right? And so they decide, they decide that it's valid, right? Because of that. Um, I'll, I'll address the question too about um, just like justice or, or fairness of it. Um, you know, I think the fact that Katin is expunged, right? The fact that um, it's that there are in fact uh, some acquittals, the fact that there are some lighter sentences, I would say the judges just went so far um, out of their way they were they were so concerned with this issues this question that you're asking right about about justice about victor's justice and so so they themselves wanted to make sure that the trials would be seen right as 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 just and fair as possible and some of the judges um, were not satisfied afterwards the french judge devab who becomes very involved in discussions after nuremberg about the potential for an international criminal court he says, like, I don't think this was just. Like, I, I have problems with the fact that that um, that you know, should it have been the case really that four victors were trying an occupied power, right? Um, if, should we do some kind of an international criminal court in the future? He says we we have to change that. We have to shift that. So I think that that's interesting too. That. Um, and that, to me, as a historian, that's what's most interesting. It's, it's the ambivalence that some of the, the main people participating right, felt about these very questions. Thank you. Uh, let's go to Ilya Altman. Ilya Altman, if you could please unmute yourself. I am Ilya Altman, a Russian Holocaust Center. Greeting from Moscow. It's late evening, but thanks. <laughs> 
for your well, thanks for coming from Moscow. presentation. I think uh, all my colleagues not not be asleep. If you have opportunity to listen to your lecture, I will be happy to read your book in Russian too, because I understood in the uh, previous time I work in the State Archive of Russian Federation, and so maybe one of the first these materials. So for me, very interesting your idea to present on the base of this book. And I listened today some new about uh, uh, academic training. I think nobody pay attention his contribution in the Nurbel trial. So it's really very interesting. Uh, uh, one question and one short comment. Uh, did you find the um, project of speech, the first speech prosecutor Roman Rudenko, when, uh, where he mentioned 5,900,000 Jews that was killed? This figure was destroyed from the, in, in his speech, it's not exist. So maybe in some materials, some correspondence between Moscow and Nuremberg, somebody from Kremlin told to him not necessary to put this figure. It's very important because in his speech, firstly, uh, Soviet sites recognized like officially 6 million uh, victims of the Holocaust. My second uh, question and comment at the same time, uh, you not mentioned uh, Russian historiography. When you spoke about Katyn, I know that Natalia Lebedeva, Dr. Yes, Natalia course. Lebedeva, describe all these questions. So I don't think that you could pay, or maybe I am wrong, something new in this uh, uh, point. Also, Alexander Zvegense recently published a lot book and movie, and his uh, in the theater November 20 will be the movie with, on his screen. Like Roman Shanian, he repeated uh, some of this process. But maybe what was your opinion about the Russian, maybe Soviet historiography? Because Arkady Poltorak was the first person who described mm -hmm. this, is, and he mentioned that the Gilbert diary not published in Russian but it's very interesting. He firstly pay attention his, his book to this very important sources. But uh, this is my question is about historiography and Rudenko added you to the Holocaust. Thank you. Oh thank you. no, thank you. That that's that's so important. So first of all, if you if you if you read my book, you'll see that I, I cite Natalia Lebedeva at length, along with um, Alexander Zvigintsev. They they are um, there's amazing scholarship that has been done in Russia with the opening of the archives on the Nuremberg trials. Um, a lot of that scholarship has been in the form of these document collections. And when I mentioned in terms of what I don't know about Katyn and the fact that some of the, I think I meant as part of that, some of what I learned, I learned from some document collections. Um, some of what I learned about Katyn was, was indeed from the research of Natalia Lebedeva and putting that together with the, the materials that I found as well. Um, Mar Marina Sorokina's work on the Extraordinary State Commission is amazing. There are so many Russian scholars who have done really great work. Um, unfortunately, some of that work hasn't made it into kind of the, still like the narrative that we have here, the story that we have here of the trials. And so again, like my, my main aim of this book was to, to tell this story and to bring in the archival research that I've done with everything else that's been published in these document collections um, and with the, the earlier scholarship in the United States as well, which is also really good. It's just a question of how do you shift the perspective by bringing all of this together and putting weaving it together into one narrative. But, but no, absolutely. And um, for, for those of you who read Russian, um, Natalia Lebedeva has an incredible document collection and has done really great work. And her work on Katkin has been translated into English as well. And I highly recommend it. In terms of that figure of um, in Rudenko's speech, I don't know. That's a really good question, but I could I could check my documents, send me an email, and I'll and I'll check and I'll see if there's any mention of it. Um, what I do know in terms of the transcript of the trials, the figure six million is mentioned by Maxwell Fife, and that's part of where we get that British the, the British um, deputy chief prosecutor in his closing speech. So, um, so yeah, that, that I'll just leave it at that. But, but no, absolutely. Um, I, I could not have done this work without, just, again, the archives and archivists and um, my conversations with Russian scholars as well. So, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Question from Sarah Brinegar. Um, 
Hi, Fran. Could you talk a little bit about the trials in the emerging Cold War? Would have also been one of my questions further down the Cold War at Nuremberg. Yeah, absolutely. So I would say in terms of thinking about the Cold War is that the Americans and the Soviets in particular, right? it's a story about four powers, but the Americans and the Soviets in particular are really in kind of a collision course kind of from the very start. And some of this is the Soviets have suffered so much right in this war, 27 million dead. Um, just atrocities. The Americans um, have had a really different experience of the war and come out of it um, really expecting to kind of lead the world, right? And so they coded Nuremberg with different things. The Soviets are expecting a trial that's going to be open and shut. Truman and Jackson go in really wanting to kind of showcase American rule of law. And, um, and so so this is, there's, there's a kind of tension from the start, this even before the Cold War on what's gonna happen and how things are gonna unfold and what things are gonna look like, but things are still very congenial. Things stay congenial. It's really in March of 1946 that, um, that the Cold War just comes like, just like blowing into the courtroom. Um, and some of this is Winston Churchill gives his Iron Curtain speech um, in Fulton, right, in the United States. He's no longer prime minister, but no matter, he's still you know, state, quite a state figure. And, um, and in this Iron Curtain speech, he calls for um, kind of resistance against Soviet tyranny. So, okay, that's one thing. The very next day in the Nuremberg courtroom is the start of the defense case. So, the, so the, you know, the timing couldn't have been worse in, in that the Soviets have actually, they've just finished their presentation, their prosecution case. They've done very well with it. And now the defense case is going to start. Churchill's made his speech and everyone goes into the courtroom and there are copies of the US Army newspaper, Stars and Stripes everywhere with the defense attorneys kind of holding it up so their clients can see, but the headline, Unite Against the Russians. And really from that point on, tensions that had been kind of boiling underneath come much more out into the open. And, um, and Arkady Polcharak actually, who, um, who one of the speakers just mentioned, who has a wonderful memoir about Nuremberg, he writes about the scene as well. And he talks about Goering's reaction to the scene and kind of the, the line that he uses is that, that Goering like understood at this moment that it wasn't just the defendants against the prosecutors, but it was also the Western powers against the Soviet Union. And the defense is really hardened by this and uses this, they really just increase their efforts to try to um, increase the gap between the Soviets and the other countries of the prosecution. And we see from Telegram's home that the Soviets really feel this, right? At this moment, they feel things starting to shift um, away from them and they feel themselves becoming increasingly isolated. So that, that moment is important. And um, throughout the defense case, there are still lots of parties. There's still lots of alcohol that still keeps things going um, and just, just fine, keeps things on track. But back in Moscow, Soviet leaders are, are, are furious and really start to interpret at that point decisions that are made every time Rudenko is voted you know, three to one, put down, and more defense evidence can come in. And every time the defense is allowed to go on at length about the secret protocols, Ribbentrop manages to bring them in and his witnesses do too, right? This is seen um, as part of an, Ang they talk about it as an Anglo-American plot against the Soviet Union. And the one other thing that I'll just say is that um, this really has implications too for what happens after the trials as well. Um, this, it's at the trials that kind of this Nuremberg and the Cold War um, really become entangled. And the whole language of human rights afterwards um, becomes used kind of in the Cold War um, by the different powers against each other as well. Thank you. A question from Elizabeth Schall that basically, that, that maybe uh, builds on, on this early discussion. Does this interaction at Nuremberg influence the Soviet interactions later in international organizations such as the UN? Absolutely. It absolutely influences them. And that's one of the things that I, I start to explore in the last chapter of the book. I'm, I'm actually really interested in it. And at some point, I'd like to do more on this. Um, because the, the Soviets, um, first of all, the Soviets understand that international organizations are important, 
right? They, they, everyone understands that international organizations are important. They're going to be important. They're not going to withdraw from the United Nations, right? They, they're going to be there. Um, at the same time, it's not just the Soviets. Everyone's kind of queasy about sovereignty, like state sovereignty. So they want to use these new institutions, right? But they want to use them to their benefit. They're a little bit wary about them. And the Soviets also use other institutions that we don't talk about very much, such as um, the, Institute, the International Organization of Democratic Lawyers, I think is the name, that the Soviets, um, that, that in, involves um, countries from the Eastern Bloc. And you know, and now we look back, oh, like what was that organization? It's talked about as a communist front. It became a communist front. But initially, when we think about the post-war moment, it's not just the United Nations. There's actually lots of different organizations. And while the United Nations is clearly going to be significant, the Soviets are also hoping to use these other organizations at the same time to help to shift the discussion in the United Nations in ways they want as well. So um, yeah, everyone. Everyone is is wary. I think this is the really interesting thing about Nuremberg. Again, right? It's it's one thing for countries to go in and to in an occupied country and to try a power that's been defeated. It's really something else entirely for countries to come together and decide that there should be like an international court, to decide that there should be these international legal institutions, and to decide that they're going to give up some of their sovereignty in order for them to function. It was because of this um, reluctance, to put it mildly, to give up sovereignty that I would say the International Criminal Court like was deferred until like well after the Cold War. It was because of this too that you know after Nuremberg there was all this talk about the Nuremberg principles like taking the principles in Article Six like like crimes against humanity, crimes against peace, and turning that into new international law. And so you know the principles everyone could agree on, but making it into a new international law code. Um, there was pushback against that, again, because of sovereignty. Um, countries have to be willing to give up something to decide that it's, you know, to, to participate in these institutions, they have to be getting something that they really want back. And so I think that, um, that that's something that, that came out of Nuremberg as, as well, just a recognition that, I mean, the Soviets thought they could control the show and, and they saw that they couldn't and they took that understanding of international institutions with them. Thank you. We're quickly running out of time. Let me see how many questions we can still get in. Um, one question from John Trevithick. Um, what, what is the difference between the two secret Soviet com commissions uh, you mentioned? Why were they created? Oh, good. I, I love talking about the nitty gritty of this stuff. So, um, so there's, there's, there's actually more than two secret commissions. There's actually a secret indictment commission initially too, um, where this, that the Soviets set up under Vyshinsky to kind of work on the indictment. And then the indictment commission is kind of folded into Vyshinsky's Nuremberg commission. And, um, and again, that commission deals with all the, the, the nitty gritty stuff on the ground. Vyshinsky is in Moscow. Many members of the commission are in Moscow. They include representatives from all the branches of the Soviet security apparatus, um, but they also include people like Aron Trainin, right? And other lawyers. And, and so that commission, like, there, there's a lot of back and forth between the Soviet delegation and, and that commission. There's also the second secret commission is a Politburo commission that's set up and attached to the Politburo high at the top. So you have one secret commission, but Vyshinsky's commission still has to get all the important things cleared, really probably everything cleared with the Politburo commission as well. So again, just the, we just get a sense here too of uh, just the amount of centralization and the amount of, of oversight that's involved in all of this. Thank you. I think we're uh, out of time, but let me just give you a chance at this very end before I'll turn it over to Eric to um, uh, bring this session to an end to talk about the legacies of, of Nuremberg. Uh, if you, you've talked about them already to some extent, but is there anything else you'd like to add in terms of the larger meaning uh, and legacies of Nuremberg? Yeah, no, thanks. I mean, this is something I've, I've thought a lot about, especially with the 75th anniversary coming up, right? Um, and I think that, you know, again, we tend to have these, these stories about, you know, Victor's justice or like Western idealism. Uh, I think the Soviet, bringing the Soviets in kind of makes, kind of complicates in some ways, like what we understand about Nuremberg's legacy. First of all, I think it reminds us that Nuremberg like, was not inevitable, 
Um, it was not simply a result of Western leadership or Western idealism, right? Um, that there's, it was really a result of lots of negotiation and compromise. And, and I think what I guess what I want to say about this is that all of that negotiation and compromise doesn't not make for a less heroic story. When I first started working on this, a few people asked me, are you sure you want to work on this? Like people really like Nuremberg. Like, why do you want to throw a wrench into it? And, um, and I think that it's really appreciating like all of the compromise, all of the negotiation, how hard it was to bring these, these countries to the table and to get stuff done. Like to me, like that's really what's heroic, right? That you have these four different countries with different experiences of the war, with different ideas about the law, the fact that they were able to come to the table. Now we might not like everything that came out of Nuremberg, but it did put together a comprehensive record of the crimes of the Third Reich it did um, set out a foundation for new laws about human rights. And yes, yeah, some of those were deferred until like 1998, but I think, that, I think that's still part of Nuremberg's legacy as well. And um, no, I, think it's a, I, think, I think in that respect, it's, it's, it's a good legacy. And if, uh, yeah, I'll just, I'll, just, I'll just leave it at that. All right. and, and thank you. Thank you so much. This was so much fun to have this chance to talk about the book today. It was indeed. So thank you, Francine. And thank you, Christian, as well as those of you who asked questions. Uh, and thanks to Tracy Fitzgerald and John Tyler of the Wilson Center, who oversaw the tech end of things. Unfortunately, that's it for today. But the Washington History Seminar returns soon, this coming Monday, November 16th at 4 p.m. in our regular time and time slot. Uh, I invite you to join us for a session on a new book by Eileen Boris entitled Making the Woman Worker, Precarious Labor and the Fight for Global Standards, 1919 to 2019, with discussant Sonia Michelle of the University of Maryland and formerly of the Wilson Center. Until then, take care and stay safe in these rather tumultuous times. Good night.